Thank you all for joining our Fair Vote webinar. We really appreciate you spending this hour with us. Um, the topic we'll be discussing today is how ranked choice voting or RCV is used at colleges and universities. My name is Ben Ostreicher. I've been an executive intern with Fair Vote since this past fall, and I'm currently on a gap year and will be attending Georgetown University in the fall where I intend to study international politics. If all of you who are attending the webinar would like to introduce yourselves in the chat, that is also totally okay. Um, I came to Fair Vote because of my passion for political change. I felt there was no better time to contribute to the work of fighting for a better and more just political system. In this role, I have seen how the structures that form the foundation of our electoral system, namely our winner take all plurality voting system, serve as a barrier to bridging partisan divides and yielding equitable representation. But here at Fair Vote, I've been able to discuss alternatives, reforms that would create a more just electoral system that ensures every voice is heard. And the reform that we focus on at Fair Vote is ranked choice voting, which is a system of voting where voters can choose their first choice candidate, but also have the opportunity to rank backup candidates um, in their later choices. So for single winner elections, if no candidate receives the majority, meaning more than 50% of first place votes, you have what is called an instant runoff that occurs where the candidate with the fewest first place votes is eliminated, their voters second choice votes are counted um, until one candidate attains majority support. Ranked choice voting can also be used in multi-winner elections via a proportional method where a threshold is established for attaining representation and excess votes and the votes for last place candidates are again redistributed so every single person has a say in who represents them. The panelists today will speak to how this system is advantageous for improving representation in their student bodies, making campaigning more civil and making elections more efficient. One great way to see the voting systems of the future is to look to college campuses because we see student elections that involve millions of young people every single year whose preferences end up forming the foundations for political advocacy in this future. So in that sense, it's really encouraging to see so many young people like the panelists we have on our webinar today um, working to adopt ranked choice voting at their own colleges and universities and seeing that through. There have been now more than 90 colleges and universities that use ranked choice voting for their student elections. That includes a majority of the Ivy League, several large public university systems that serve tens of thousands of students, and schools in the majority of US states. Overall, we, the colleges and universities that use ranked choice voting now compose more than 1.6 million students in 30 states. These elections offer both proof of concept for the efficacy of ranked choice voting elections, and they pave the way for young people like those on this call today to become advocates for electoral reform in their cities, states, and the country at large in all of the years to come. During this discussion, our panelists will talk about why they made the switch to RCV and how RCV is shaping their student elections. So I'll pose the first several questions, but then we're gonna open it up to all of you. So if you do have questions you'd like to ask at any point, feel free to use the Q&A and chat function below to ask them. And you can go ahead and leave those at any time. Um, and our fair vote team is going to continually monitor those questions and we'll make sure that before the end we can ask all of the questions that you have. But with that in mind, I'm going to introduce you to our amazing panelists on this call today. So uh, with us uh, first is Joshua Browse. He's a government major at Colby College from New Haven, Connecticut. In Colby student government, He's a class president for the class of 2023, and Josh helped shepherd the passage of ranked choice voting at Colby this summer and fall. Charles Aborisa Jr. is an intern at Fair Vote with the executive department. He's a junior at the George Washington University studying political science and philosophy. At George Washington University, Charles serves as an undergraduate senator at large in their student government, which is elected with ranked choice voting. Chloe Wagner is a third year student at the George Washington University Honors Program studying political science. Chloe's professional experience focuses on campaign finance and federal elections. And at GW, Chloe serves as the commissioner of the GW Joint Elections Commission, which helps run RCV elections. And then finally with us here is Kaylin Thomas, who's a student leader and community advocate from Atlanta, Georgia. He's a senior at Georgia State University, majoring in political science with a minor in public policy. Kaylin serves as the university-wide student body president for the Student Government Association at Georgia State University, and he served within various leadership roles within the Student Government Association. All right, so welcome to all of you, and we're going to start with Charles. 
So you, along with me, have been interning here at Fair Vote and advocating for all of these electoral reforms. And one of the reforms that we're talking about today is ranked choice voting. So I was wondering if you could elaborate um, on what you think the problems uh, are that ranked choice voting addresses and why is ranked choice voting an advantageous way to go about elections? And then what made you kind of personally passionate about these electoral reforms such that you are now advocating for them? Sure, thanks Ben for the question. Um, I think the main issue that RCV tries to solve is one surrounding equity and equity in the electoral system. Um, what we see right now in the first past the post system is where we can have a candidate win 30% of the vote, right? And still win the election, whereas 70% of the electorate didn't vote for them or voted for someone else or didn't vote at all. Um, I think that kind of goes into a situation of where is this candidate really going to be the representation or an accurate representation of what those constituents want or what they uh, want to see in the government? And I think that's the one the advantageous part of uh, our ranked choice voting because it's pretty much the aggregate of everyone's preference and sort of uplifts um, their uh, unified voice and unified preference in uh, their local elections. Um, but just beyond that, when it comes to uh, uh, um, the advantages RCV uh, provides uh, elections is that one, it eliminates uh, the need for runoffs. Um, runoffs, right, can uh, a second election could actually hurt a, a voter turnout, especially for those who had a, a trouble voting the first time around, uh, which are typically going to be uh, low income or minority communities as well. Um, additionally, um, forces candidates to actually not for but incentivizes candidates um, to actually uh, campaign to a broader electorate as well. Um, what we see now is that now in RCV, instead of uh, voting or trying to uh, advocate toward their specific niche, niches of society, they're actually forced to uh, uh, advocate for their people's second, third, and fourth, and so forth round of, of preference. Um, so that kind of broadens their scope of, of uh, campaigning as well. Um, but I'll also just add that it's si super simple for the RCV. Uh, for example, now you're not left with the choice of having um, uh, choosing the lesser of two evils, but now you can actually choose your preferences in a manner that uh, that shows your preference in the electoral system itself. And I think that kind of creates a lot more easy, easygoing electoral system or electoral process for people. Um, but that's to, to, to address the other question about why uh, I'm personally passionate about electoral reform. Um, I will say that one of the main reasons why I came to DC was to uh, learn how I can use politics as a tool to uplift certain voices. And I think that the most uh, the, the, the ultimate form of uplifting people's voices is through the electorate, is through the voting booth. And I think that working at Fair Vote and the work that Fair Vote does when it comes to electoral reform to actually uplift voices in a way that's representative of the constituents is, uh, is a testament to that, uh, to that uh, main mission that I strive to uh, achieve. Wow, yeah, thanks so much, Charles. That was a really good answer. Um, and now we're gonna turn to ranked choice voting on college campuses um, specifically. So we're gonna start with Josh. Um, and I know that you helped spearhead Colby College's passage of ranked choice voting in the fall. And I was hoping you could shed some light on specifically how ranked choice voting is being used in student elections. Um, so I was wondering first, like why did you choose to make the switch to ranked choice voting at Colby? And how did being in the state of Maine, which is uh, one of now two states that uses ranked choice voting for their statewide elections play into that decision to choose to adopt ranked choice voting on your campus? Sure, thanks, Ben. Uh, yeah, so I think our chief consideration the whole time was obviously it was just equity and smarter democracy is just was, was really a value that we wanted to be able to prioritize in our elections and, and the plurality voting that we we're using in the past just wasn't satisfying that anymore. Uh, but there was also just a really serious practical element of we were running into really crowded fields of candidates, which is a great problem to have, of course. Uh, but we were also seeing a lot of runoffs with just really unfortunate drops in turnout. And that really was only contributing to a system of voting that we saw as, as not doing it for us. Um, like you said, Maine was one of the first states uh, to really full on adopt ranked choice voting for statewide elections. Uh, it adopted it in 2016. And this was another one of our really serious considerations was when we adopted in, I think the late summer of 2020, we were looking at the election coming up and we knew that students were gonna have to vote in a ranked choice ballot in, ballot in Maine, or a lot of them uh, that weren't voting absentee. And I think, considering kind of some of the major complaints about ranked choice voting historically. I think one of the biggest one is just that it's confusing and that people might have a hard time being able to figure it out. Uh, and with that in mind, I think we wanted to take a proactive step and kind of 
enabling students to understand the system better by starting on campus. And we were able to do that through student government and we were able to hold a really great election pretty easily uh, on a ranked choice platform right before the 2020 election. And then students were able to walk into the ballot uh, confidently. So that was important to us. And I think it's good to be able to keep with, with the values of, of these main elections that we really support and, and hope to see that expanded throughout the nation. Yeah, that's really awesome. It's really heartening to see uh, so many new schools reforming their elections. And we at Fairvote have definitely observed that colleges in the cities and states that use ranked choice ballots are also more likely to follow suit and expose their students to ranked choice voting in student government because they see the utility and they want them to actually be involved um, in making sure that they understand how to use those ranked choice ballots. So that's really cool. Um, now we'll turn to Kaylin. At, and so I know that Georgia State uh, University really recently adopt, voted to adopt ranked choice voting uh, in its student government. So I was wondering if you could shed some light on what was that process like in terms of actually moving from the idea of ranked choice voting uh, to actually getting it passed? And what was kind of the process of changing your election system like and were you met with any resistance? And what made you passionate about helping make sure that this change uh, ended up affecting the Georgia State University student body? Well, thanks, Ben. First of all, it's good to see you again. Um, the idea of ranked choice voting at Georgia State really came from a senator from a previous year that I had served with. Um, his name is uh, Khalil Anderson Garrett. He unfortunately no longer goes to Georgia State, but the idea that he left behind ranked choice voting was something that uh, I definitely wanted to see through to fruition. And this year, I realized that I had a tremendous opportunity to make that a reality, um, being the next university-wide president of Georgia State. And so I got to work. And I'm sure all of our SGAs have experienced this year that we've had a number of issues to deal with. And at Georgia State, we have had our fair share of issues to deal with. And so for quite some time, ranked choice voting didn't come up in our student government, um, but it did come up right around February, uh, right around time elections um, were supposed to have started. And so when that idea got brought up, we ended up having to postpone our election season for a short period of time. We've now pushed it back to um, ballots applications are now open. Um, but it's been pushed back some, it's been pushed back quite a while, and I'll explain how that's affected um, this year's election season a little bit later. But when it was brought up, it wasn't met with any uh, real opposition. Um, my student government, all of our officers were very receptive to the idea at first. Uh, the only major concern was educating students on what ranked choice voting is, how is it beneficial to them, and what it's going to look like when they come down to selecting candidates on the ballot. And so we had some officers work on some infographics. Uh, I think we also used um, website to sort of explain it a little bit better. And we actually used Fair Votes template uh, to structure our legislation when passing ranked choice voting at Georgia State. So it wasn't uh, as difficult as maybe some of us might have thought it was going to be at first. And when it came up, or excuse me, when it came down to a vote um, in our university-wide Senate, um, it passed without resistance. It was a unanimous vote, and we were very happy that it passed. Now, we did in that legislation, that same piece of legislation, um, require that it start next year because we felt like starting it this year during this election season was going to be a little bit too much, a little too rushed. However, we've now realized that in pushing back the election season, um, if we do not pass ranked choice voting this administration, then the potential for a runoff to push the election season even further um, past our inauguration date and the date when um, our administration is supposed to leave office is going to challenge our, our very um, institution of student self-governance. So that was one of the main reasons why now there's some new legislation to amend the date that ranked choice voting is going to start to this 
administration. And I am very confident that that will pass in the next two weeks. So we've had some we had some difficulties, but we also we thought we've also had some successes, and I'm really proud about that at Georgia State. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. It's really interesting to kind of get a window into the process of each specific school, um, and that's really interesting. Uh, one other thing that we kind of wonder about, and I know that you were talking about kind of adopting ranked choice voting, is kind of what do elections look like with ranked choice voting, and Many of the proponents that we've been talking about today have been talking about how it can make campaigning more civil and result in more equitable representation. Um, so I think a great person to speak to that is Chloe Wagner because she is the chair of the GW Joint Election Commission and is responsible for actually running elections that have ranked choice ballots. So uh, I was wondering if you could talk to us about you know, how ranked choice voting has impacted uh, GW and specifically has it changed how candidates campaign has it affected the type of candidates that win? And what have kind of elections been like using this system? Absolutely. Thanks for that question, Ben. We adopted ranked choice voting last year, um, specifically for our presidential and vice presidential races. Those were the only ones that were conducted using ranked choice voting. Everything else was first past the post. Um, and we noticed last year that there were a lot more conversations happening. Um, in the past at GW, there have been some really fraught elections. Um, a lot of runoffs, things like that. Um, and it really changed the way that candidates were approaching the process. You know, a candidate can say, well, I, I can understand if I'm not your first vote, but can I be your second or your third or your fourth vote? Um, and it really encourages conversations around all types of issues, different issues that people are facing on different parts of campus, different parts of the country. Um, and I think it's really helped encourage um, those discussions and make our campaign and election season just better, more fruitful, um, and in the end, create more policies, candidates that are in tune with the student body. Um, and hopefully, uh, we see legislation once those people are um, sworn in that actually does reflect all of those conversations that they were having the semester before. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's really encouraging to see all of that happening in practice. Uh, I think it's also worth kind of taking a step back to think about these student elections in the broader context of the electoral reform movement. Here at Fair Vote, we really believe that ranked choice voting is the future and that the US entirely would be better served by an electoral system that encourages voters to express the full scope of their preferences on a ranked choice ballot. So we'll turn back to Charles. Um, and I was wondering if you could help us address this. Um, so how do you think that ranked choice voting at colleges kind of fits into the broader movement of electoral reform that Fair Vote and other organizations advocate for? What's the significance of this system now being used by 1.6 million students? Um, and it's interesting that just a few years ago, I mean, there were like nearly half as many schools using RCV. So what is kind of this increasing trend of colleges adopting ranked choice voting? Tell us about kind of the broader movement for better elections. Yeah, sure. So I think the this really comes down to idea of I think this was stated earlier in this webinar about proof of concept. Um, it demonstrates how this is actually can be something that implemented can actually run smoothly and can actually create a more equitable uh, government, whether it be through college campuses or even if you uh, uh, derive this and take this to the to a larger extent, uh, city council. Uh, mayor or any other elected official you 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 can think of so i think that's the number one thing and once you show proof of concept in a university level it actually bolsters the rcv movement um in the national level when it comes to implementation because we actually have something that works we have something that can that that uh that's proven to actually create a more equitable uh, environment, uh, politically that is and i think that on the other side of the coin with that as well it also helps us uh, move forward when it comes to people when it comes to the implementation stage in the national level. Um, I think that once we have students who are implement who are incorporated who know how to, about the RCV system who actually used it before as well, um, and then at the same time have those gains, whether it be through certain cities or localities implementing RCV, uh, it creates uh, not only an elector that's actually informed, but it's actually able to uh, seamlessly transition to a. Uh, a ranked choice system. So I think that's really uh, one of the main uh, importance of having um, RCV on campus as well. But just as to what you explained earlier about how the growing numbers of universities um, using RCV, it's really a testament to how uh, how RCV has really changed the electoral landscape and it's really changed it for the better that is, I think. Um, it shows that 
that we can create a more equitable system while having a fair, safe election. Um, and I think that's something that's catching on to other universities, not just you know the few that started, but also West Coast, South, and, and it's moving all over the country. So I think that really shows uh, the proof of concept on that front as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and that's part of, I think, a really cool reason why Fair Vote is kind of uh, continuing to track and analyze um, these processes and really uplift the students who are kind of part of these processes. I know, so I know that one of the challenges to running any election with a new voting system like ranked choice voting, whether it's a college or whether it's like a city or a state, is making sure that the candidates and voters understand the system and, you, and that they're educated about it as people obviously need to understand the new voting system for it to be effective and for them to successfully use it. And that is kind of one of the chief considerations for whether or not people are even adopting ranked choice voting in the first place. So I was wondering if Josh, you could talk about how this process has gone at Colby in terms of how have people, including the students and candidates reacted to the new voting system and how has kind of the process of running elections with RCV gone in practice with having this new voting system? Sure, thanks, Ben. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, I think Colby, we were pretty lucky in that we had some really valuable infrastructure, just educational infrastructure that was provided for us. We had professors in our government department that have been doing significant research and really kind of speaking for RCV uh, at the state level and really in the effort and trying to implement it in 2016, Colby played a pretty big role in, in kind of making sure people understood what was going on and what, what we were trying to advocate for. Um, we, within the SGA, in the early fall of 2020, passed a constitutional amendment, uh, and that's really all it took. It was a pretty smooth transition. Uh, our elections usually were held on an online platform called Simply Voting. It's a pretty easy system. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, um, but all we had to do was really switch from, you know, we're going from plurality to ranked choice, and they can vote. They can fill in as many names as they want and, and really it, it took off from there. Uh, we obviously wanted to play a pretty proactive role in educating people just because you know there was a pretty significant value in knowing that two months later, all the students that were voting on that platform would be headed to the polls uh, to do the same thing. So I think we really spent a good amount of time trying to thoroughly explain the process of ranked choice voting to make sure students really understood it, uh, but also utilizing kind of existing processes at Colby for just like, really good resources of helping students understand what's been going on in Maine in the past four years and just the changes we've seen thus far. Yeah, thanks. That's really interesting. Uh, great answer, Josh. I know a common alternative to ranked choice voting elections is runoff elections, which are also trying to kind of achieve that same goal of majority support for the winner. But uh, both and both Georgia State University prior to kind of making the switch to RCV and as we have all seen in this last election cycle, the state of Georgia more broadly uses these runoff elections. And so I think Kaylin, you'd be a great person to kind of address this um, as I know that many schools and even states and cities are using runoff elections to try to achieve this goal of majority representation. But could you kind of explain why these runoff elections are not the optimal way of doing so? And what are the downsides to using runoff elections rather than RCV? And how do you feel like your experience with runoff elections at Georgia State University and in the state of Georgia shaped your decision to support ranked choice voting as an alternative? Thanks, Ben. So at Georgia State, the student government election season usually spans from uh, mid to late February when ballot applications open up to about the end of April, um, just before finals week, when the first round of elections um, and voting have been completed. So after that's happened, usually we have, an, we have a winner to announce by then. But in the case that there is a runoff yeah. election, then we have um, another period as outlined in our previous um, SGA bylaws that um, after that has happened, then if there are, if there is a candidate that has not received more than I believe it's, I know before I said it was 15%, but I did some research, it's 10%, um, more than the candidate with the second highest number of votes, then it automatically triggers a runoff between those two candidates. And actually that is what has happened in SG elections for um, not only during my election, but the past two presidential elections before us. Um, and so what that does is not only does it delay um, the start of a new administration, um, which is inauguration day on May 7th, 
uh, but it also um, it also decreases turnout, like Charles has talked about. Um, less students are able to come out and take place because runoff usually happens um, the week before finals week, um, and students are busy. They're trying to you know study. They're trying to pass their classes. The last thing that they're worried about is showing up a second time for another student government election. And I realized that in supporting ranked choice voting, um, I'm actually um, taking an active stance against my own election because we had a runoff and I did not receive a majority of the votes. However, the candidate that I was running against uh, was unfortunately disqualified from the race. So I understand that me, myself, for my election, if we had ranked choice voting, I wouldn't have won. And I think that's actually a good thing because I think that candidates do need to have a majority of support um, for all the diverse opinions, um, for all the diverse people that we have at Georgia State, um, for them to be taken uh, accounted of. And so when we were talking about 55,000 students across six campuses throughout the state of Georgia, that's a lot of people. That's, that's a lot of diversity that is bringing uh, these students to the table. And so I want to make sure that um, in future elections, not only does the runoffs get completely cut out and we can start a new administration on the day we're supposed to start a new administration, but also that future candidates, not only in our presidential race, our executive vice president races, but also our Senate races, all elections um, are using ranked choice voting and that those candidates have a majority support of the students behind. Yeah, thank you so much, Kaylin. That was really insightful. Um, another important aspect of running a ranked choice voting election is presenting the results to the student body and actually running the election itself, which can be more difficult when it has multiple rounds, both in kind of a single winner form and a multi winner form, both of which GW has. So I was wondering if Chloe, you could shed some light on how do you at GW present the results of your ranked choice voting elections and what systems are students using to vote? And are they working seamlessly with ranked choice voting both for single winner races and your multi winner races, which I know use the proportional form of ranked choice voting? Thanks for that question. Um, I'll start off with how we actually vote on campus. We have a system that's called Engage um, that the university pays for and that all student orgs are required to be on. And thankfully this year, we have now figured out how to do ranked choice voting for all seats, um, both single seat and multi-seat races. Uh, so on the day or days of voting, uh, students will get an email that basically says log on and you can vote. Uh, in that ballot, we try to put as much information as possible. Of course, there's always problems of people not reading that information and just voting however they want to. Uh, but with the JEC, the Joint Elections Commission, uh, we are really striving to make sure that all of the information is laid out very clearly um, and that they know some of the intricacies. Like if you don't want to rank a candidate, you don't need to rank a candidate. And that if you do rank a candidate, it could influence the uh, how the election turns out, even if they're last um, in your rankings. So we have been doing a lot of work there just to make sure that before people are voting, they actually know what's happening. And that makes presenting the results a lot easier. Uh, we are also very clear in how we present those results. We go step by step. We have lots of graphs, um, lots of explanations. Um, and it does get a little bit tricky. There were a lot, uh, there was some controversy last year about how we did it, um, how the results were presented, and we um, are gonna do our best this year to try and make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, but I think having really clear um, information for voters on how ranked choice voting works makes presenting those results that much easier at the end. Yeah, that's great. Um, and at this point in time, we're gonna kind of move on to questions from our audience um, beyond the questions that we've already asked so that we can kind of get a sense of what other people are wondering about your ranked choice voting elections. So we're gonna start with a question, uh, question that both Charles Lyons and Sarah Hill uh, sim were both similarly asking, which was how are other schools um, and tabulating their results? Are they using paper ballots? Are they using an in-house system or an outside service? 
Um, and I think that both Josh and Chloe have kind of already touched on the election systems that they use, but I was wondering if you could repeat just so that these people who asked the question can hear once again, um, what specific election system that you're, that you're using um, for collecting the ballots and tabulating the results. So starting with Josh, um, could you answer that question? Sure. Uh, we're totally virtual, which has been a very much of an asset during COVID. Uh, but yeah, again, just again, we use simply voting. Uh, it's a really convenient resource. Uh, it's been really helpful. They've been super easy to work with, highly recommend. Uh, and they also were really friendly to rank choice. And I think that was made the consideration a lot easier on our end when we were really thinking of how practical it was going to be to implement something like this. Like it, it was it was convenient, to say the least. Great. And Chloe, could you also talk about the system that you use once again? Yeah, as I mentioned, we use um, a form called Engage where all students uh, can sign on. People can only vote once, et cetera. Um, from there, once the polls close, uh, the Joint Elections Commission will export everything in a spreadsheet and we put it into a program called OppaVote that we do pay for. Uh, they do offer free services as well. Um, and that will calculate all of the um, results of whether we're doing instant runoff, um, or single transferable vote. They have many different ways to uh, do ranked choice voting, um, but they will calculate the results for us within minutes and then we can disseminate the information and election results from there. Great, thanks so much. I think that was really helpful for those that asked that question. Next, we're gonna turn to a question that both Janet and Andrew had similarly, which is what were kind of the most common concerns from students that you were hearing when you were thinking about enacting RCV? And how did you kind of address those concerns during that process? So um, maybe Kaylin, I think that you briefly talked about um, in my question about something similar. So maybe you could start us off. And if anyone else um, on the panel is interested, um, feel free to tag on after Kaylin speaks. Yeah, so we haven't had very much feedback from students just yet, um, but the concerns that we received from uh, the officers that voted on the legislation had to do with um, how are we going to educate students on what exactly ranked choice voting is, what it means to them, why it's beneficial, um, how votes are going to be tabulated, um, what kind of services are we going to use in order to tabulate votes, um, how transparent is the entire process going to be, um, and just basically concerns like that. And I'm really glad that Chloe um, spoke on the kind of systems that they use. And so maybe that's something that we can also look into. Great. Yeah, that was really helpful. Um, and getting to kind of see those concerns and getting to see it, you know, end up passing unanimously, I think really is a testament to the fact that when people, you know, are fully educated about how ranked choice voting will impact their elections, we really do see those positive results. So another person was wondering about kind of how these elections are situated in this world of COVID that has already really impacted all kinds of elections. Um, so the question was, how has COVID impacted student turnout in elections? And has ranked choice voting then also had any impact on the turnout in those elections similarly? And Joshua, I think that you'd be a great person to answer that question. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, uh, in the spring of 2020, I ran for class president out of the, my childhood bedroom uh, after being sent home from college. It was a very strange experience. Uh, it was totally virtual. I was running a campaign fully through social media. Uh, students, I think, throughout the college were just sitting home, just waiting, kind of biding their time and didn't have much to do. Uh, but our election ended up having the highest turnout out of any in our college's history because it was run just about fully virtually. And I think people had a lot of time on their hands. Uh, in regards to ranked choice, we hadn't yet implemented. Um, but what we did see was that we had to inevitably kind of go to a runoff because we were using plurality systems. And even though we had such high turnout, it ended up kind of going down about 10% uh, for the runoff election. Got it. Yeah, uh, just addressing that question again um, for the, the person who asked um, how just more broadly RCV um, has affected the turnout in student elections beyond COVID. Um, this is kind of a question that Fair Vote is indeed researching and that we're kind of in the process of um, looking at more systematically. On our website called RCV in Student Elections, we have uh, each school that has adopted ranked choice voting and 
when we have been able to find data about how their turnout has been affected by RCV, we've used it. So you can kind of see anecdotes of schools that have seen really great turnout results with RCV, but kind of in a more systematic sense, we're also uh, continuing to study this. Um, and we will soon hopefully be kind of releasing more comprehensive results about what we know about ranked choice voting and turnout specifically in student elections. Moving on from the question of turnout, Ashley Seller wanted us to talk about kind of the most challenging parts of implementing RCV being kind of that teaching and explaining process that we talked about a little bit earlier. So Ashley was wondering kind of what are some suggestions on how to describe this process to students and what are some methods, whether it's, you know, graphics or analogies that have been effective in really getting that process to click with students. Um, maybe Chloe, could you talk a little bit about how you've done that at GW? Yeah, um, I have to say that some things are definitely more successful than others. Um, graphs are fantastic. There are definitely lots of even really short, maybe like three minute YouTube videos that do a really great job of explaining um, in very simple terms how rate choice voting works. Um, we have tried to do like step, step by step ex explanations, um, videos, etc. Um, I don't know if one of them really works better than the other, but I think having multiple ways of explaining it to students so that if they don't understand one thing, they can always turn to a different resource and having a multitude of those available um, is definitely something that we are trying to do this year. Great. Um, Kaylin, do you also want to talk about how you kind of explained what ranked choice voting was like to your student body? So um, during our Senate meeting, when we first brought it up, um, we, I believe we went on a website, a open source sort of ranked choice voting um, how to website, which actually allowed us to run sort of like a mock ranked choice voting election right then and there. And I think at first where officers were a little apprehensive because they didn't really understand what it meant. After we ran that simulation, everyone was much more comfortable with the idea and once we started talking more about it and we had um, a little bit more expertise on the subject, um, I think that's where we found that unanimous support for passing the legislation. Yeah, that's great. And kind of more broadly, I think it's worth, uh, if people are looking for these types of resources in terms of educating their student bodies, one great way is running those mock elections. FairVote has a resource called rankit.vote that um, allows you to kind of simulate a small scale ranked choice voting election. And that's a totally free resource. Beyond that, um, one of the big resources that FairVote has available for schools using ranked choice voting is a guide for how to actually implement ranked choice elections at a, at a college. So we, that's both in terms of the template Kaylin talked about, but our broader guide also has examples of different graphics and videos that people can use in order to kind of teach what ranked choice voting is as kind of once we find that once people kind of hear about it and see it in a simple form, it becomes really intuitive for how it works. But kind of that initial barrier towards getting people to understand, you know, what it is when I say ranked choice voting um, is a really, uh, you know, great way to, for them to start being able to have it click for them. So another question that uh, was here in the chat was from Armin. Uh, hopping off of the fact that Josh had mentioned they use simplyvoting.com to vote. And Armin was wondering if price was a barrier for any university elections. And other people can also address that. But Josh, do you want to start with how the elections themselves are getting funded? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll say Colby has a couple of really good things going for it here. We're a small private college of about 2,000 people. To run an election with the size of our student body is not too arduous of a process. Uh, Pricing-wise, I think it cost as much as it had previously. Like again, I think simply voting was really convenient in the way that we were just already going off of simply voting for plurality votes and all we had to do was really switch a button, which was easy. Um, this is obviously not always gonna be the case. I think if, if we're working with a student body of, of tens of thousands of people, it's you're looking at really different numbers, but at least for us, you know, we were able to handle it and it wasn't too much of a burden financially. And Chloe, could you also talk about um, at GW, I know you also mentioned that you were using a paid platforms. How are your elections getting funded and this cost any bit of a barrier for that? Yeah, we, the Joint Elections Commission will ask for money from our student association. So current senators will approve any funding across. Um, Charles is actually the uh, head of our finance committee. So he has been an instrumental part in making sure that we have money to fund our elections. Uh, so, 
are, I think we've requested about $3,000 this year. Um, we are planning on running a few of our elections twice to make sure that all votes, um, that the count at the end of it is secure and we're confident in the results of the election. Um, the cost hasn't been too much of a barrier because we do have great funding at GW for student association uh, activities, uh, but it was definitely something that we had a debate about that um, we considered before uh, choosing to use this platform for grant choice voting. Yeah, that's great. Um, in terms of more resources that people can be looking for, um, especially if cost is a barrier. Um, that fair vote guide I was talking about does have um, a list of different systems that are compatible with ranked choice voting. Um, some of them have different cost issues, some of them don't. There's also the RCV Universal Tabulator, which is a resource from the RCV Resource Center. And that's a free tabulation that after you've captured the votes, if you input it into the Universal Tabulator, it uses open source software um, to be able to tabulate all the votes um, for free. And this is even used by some cities and states that also use ranked choice voting. One other thing I'd kind of add to this question is that I know that some schools do have kind of in-house platforms. So um, at Georgetown University, for example, um, we have a platform that was coded by a past student um, and then has just been passed on year after year, which kind of helps eliminate that cost barrier. So, um, you know, it's, it's not that it that this is something that every school can do, but sometimes I've seen, you know, in several of the schools that I've talked to about ranked choice voting, that they've either collaborated with the computer science department or specific students in their student government who have been able to even, you know, help make that system themselves. Um, great. So I think that is all of the questions that uh, people have for the most part addressed. So I was wondering um, if there's anything else the panelists want to make sure they add in um, before we sort of wrap up the webinar. Any any other comments about uh, your elections that you want to make sure you got in? All right. Um, yeah, go for it, Charles. Yeah, I was just going to answer. I think there was a question um, in the chat uh, from uh, David Holtzman who asked, how do you handle mid-year vacancies? Um, use the already cast ballots or continue instant runoff. Um, I'm not sure how it works at other schools, but here at GW, at GW that is, um, they don't go through the, um, um, the election process. They have a separate process where they have to get confirmed by what we have the Gov and Nominations Committee. And then they have to, once they approve in that committee, they get approved by the full Senate. Um, so they don't have to go through a full, they don't have to go through a full election cycle when it comes to vacancies. Uh, I'm not sure how it works for other universities, but that's how it works at, at GW, that is. Great. Um, so at this point, we're going to begin to wrap up our panel. So thank you so much to all the panelists and everyone who joined this panel. Um, it is really great to see so many people interested in student elections and to see this entirely student-run panel um, discussing their election systems and discussing the way ranked choice voting has impacted their systems. So it is amazing. And we are really heartened to see this, these elections continue to expand to states and cities all across the country. And we encourage you to continue to keep track of them. And if you are yourself a college student, to, continue to help advocate for your own schools to be able to use this system. Um, one last plug is that Every Votes Counts is a student-led nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing voter turnout. And they help expand voter access nationwide and help students, chapters, and partners become hubs of civic engagement on campus and lead initiative areas in elections and voter engagement, civic education, and pro-voter advocacy and reform, um, including ranked choice voting. Um, and we can send you more information about how to get in touch with them if you're interested in our follow-up email. Um, and they help, again, you know, shepherd you know, movements for ranked choice voting on college campuses um, on the ground.